about us. Okay, it is January 30th, Wednesday, January 30th. We are going to pick up in Revelation 18.23. I actually told you that we finished 18 last week, but we so rushed through the end that when I was coming back into the field for today, I realized there's a couple of thoughts that may not have really been clarified. So I want to make sure that I get them out to you. So 23 and 24 is going to be a quick, quick review. And then you've got to wonder, because you all know chapter 19 deals with Armageddon, and I just told you, this is going to be a great class. This is going to be this one of those boom, boom, boom. And you got to wonder, okay, Armageddon, and she's like that? Well, let's find out why. <laughs> okay. In verse 23 of uh, Revelation 18, remember 18? We've been talking about the destruction of physical Babylon, the, the commercial, political, the spot, geographic, on the Euphrates. This is the tangible, the one that we can feel, where 17 was the mystery Babylon, the spiritual, all of that. So when we read in the end, the light and the lamp will not, let, let me back up and just read for you. We won't talk about it, but I'll read for you from 21 on. A strong angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, So Babylon, the great city, will be thrown down with violence, will be found no longer. The sound of harpists, musicians, flute players, trumpeters will not be heard any longer. No craftsman of any craft will be found in you any longer. The sound of the mill will not be heard any longer. Every avenue of life, from enjoyment to what you need for work to what you need to live, everything is destroyed and gone once that millstone has hit the sea to destroy that one. The light and the lamp, uh, um, excuse me, and the light of a lamp will not shine in you any longer. And the voice of the bridegroom and the bride will not be heard in you any longer. For your merchants were the great men of the earth, because all the nations were deceived by your sorcery. That's one thing we didn't cover well. And in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all who had been slain on the earth. Wow. What a condemnation. What is coming against this great city? We see all of these joys are gone, but did you catch what I emphasize? Her sorceries. We even get the word pharmakeia, or, or pharmakeia is the Greek word, but pharmacy, drugs, drug activity, that sort of thing. If you don't believe that, that drugs that alter the mind don't open you up to the pit of hell, then you're sleeping. Wake up and smell the coffee, people, because it is going to relate it. When Satan can begin to mind control, he's got a way in, and he, he can do such horrors there. It was almost as if Mr. Babylon had a magic spell that sent out a religious... Um, yeah, it, it brought like a coma. It got them, you know, like you see cult leaders do, where they, they just, I'm sorry? It's like a fervor, and it, it's like they cease thinking for themselves, and it just, it, it, it's a stupor that comes over them, and they just go along with it. We saw it in 17, and in 18, we're seeing also that in every avenue of life, she has permeated and, and cast her spell on them. And in that, she has done her wickedness, her sorceries. She wanted to be the center. And really what she was the center of was demonology. I mean, that's what it is. It's the demons come up out of the pit. It's her, you know, cohorts. Because Satan is not God's opposite. He can't be everywhere at once. But he's got thousands and thousands, a myriad number of, of cohorts. The demons are the fallen angels. And a third of the heaven fell with him. And that's who he sends out to do all of the, this evil. And they do it through the drugs. They do it through areas in ways that would seem like it's fine, but the end result is it was a slippery slope right into hell. We see also that astrology started in Babylon. Remember the, the Tower of Babel, the, the astrological beliefs that came out of that? Well, it seems as if all of that's going to come to the end here also, as if that sin has gone full circle now and come back, and this millstone is going to hit that one, hit hard, and it's going to destroy. And we talked about it last week that it could be literally something like a meteorite that falls from heaven, does fall into the Euphrates, and if you've ever seen a person cannonball into a swimming pool, well, this is bigger than a person and it's bigger than a swimming pool, but it could be something that sends up, sends up that devastation and God allows that to literally drown Babylon, that at the same time, because Babylon's sitting on uh, volcanic activity, the earthquake could come from the volcanic upheaval and it, the crust of the earth could break up and it could literally swallow up and take her down. 
It could be that she's just under the waters, like Sodom and Gomorrah are under uh, the Dead Sea. It could be that she would go all the way into the heart of the earth and into the pit of hell, because the prophecies we read last week talked about a total destruction on Babylon, that Babylon would not be rebuilt again, would not be found anymore, and if it goes straight into the pit of hell, it's not coming back out. So however it is, whether it's that complete of annihilation, or whether it's just getting across to us, it's done. It's over, and it will not be able to be a center of activity for Satan and his cohorts anymore. Well, we'll find out when, when we see it from the bleacher seats. <laughs> question. Yes. So, we're talking about the religious Babylon will go down? But the religious, I think, has gone down um, also, but I was talking about the literal. That right. there's going to, remember, it's sudden and by fire and by the hand of God that Babylon would be destroyed, and it wouldn't be rebuilt. We know today Babylon's been being rebuilt. We know that there's a, a prophecy that there would not be a, a brick left. And we know that they've used literal bricks that are thousands of years old that they're using and building on top of even today in the building that's going on in Babylon. So we're talking literal. But I also believe, because remember we saw that the head of, of um, the false religions was the Roman Catholicistic system. But they're not in Babylon. That's what. That's my next question. Right, right. So in that case, that's when it's talking symbolically about the religion coming down. And I do believe that the religion is at the hand of the Antichrist attacked. Because remember, he's gone along with it to about the midpoint. Because she had her tenants all over the world. She had control of people's minds and, and in their lives, whether they realize it or not. Many are under a form of her control. But she's getting the worship. She's the queen of heaven. She's got her, and, and remember, I'm not attacking people. I'm attacking the, the system. She's got her pope, who is supposed to be Christ on earth, being worshipped, literally being worshipped and being followed. But what does the Antichrist want? He wants that. He wants to be worshipped. He wants to be number one. He's not going to share it at the point when he puts his image in the temple and says, you'll bow down to me where it's off with your head. You'll take my mark or you'll be beheaded. You can't buy, you can't sell, you can't do anything. No economy, no nothing in your world. And like someone even reminded me, he can put that guillotine to the neck of your loved one. Take my mark, follow me, bow down and worship me, or I'm going to kill your wife and your children. I mean, he has all kinds of ways to go out, but he wants 100% control. And he wants control like Hitler on steroids. Like the greatest tyrant you can think of, Julius Caesar or whoever, not, it wasn't Julius Caesar, but who was the one? Nero. Nero. That's what I was trying to think. You know. Like that, only ten times worse. So he's not going to share with the Pope. And he also sees all that wealth of the Vatican, and he needs that wealth. And especially, I think at a time when his headquarters of Babylon has been destroyed, he's going to want to be robbing that wealth because he's going to build himself back up. I do believe he's going to go over to Jerusalem because that's where the temple is and he wants to worship there, and that's where his buddy, the false prophet, is. So if his false prophet's set up nice and well, and he's just lost everything he needs, well, I'll go over here and I'll share with my buddy, get out of the way, <laughs> and go on from there. So I, I believe it's both. For a while, he's walked hand in hand. And there are even ways that we see, and I am not good at this, and I'm trying to find the CD that I know has the teaching that I heard once, that there's uh, ways that the Muslim religion and Roman Catholicism, I'm, I'm going to use the word, marry. And they literally did. They took one from one, and they took one from the other, and they brought them together in a marriage, but it was a political strategy for these two countries, for the power to mix and to come together. Well, I think that's... a, a sample of what the Antichrist does with Roman Catholicism. He marries it for a while. He goes along with it. Because remember at first the harlot's riding the beast. And that sounds like she's got control. And at first I think she's going to think she does. You know, she's going to work through him also. They both want the same thing. They both want this world control. And so, you know, we look like good buddies, but you know how among the, the uh, thieves and robbers, you know, there is no honor. Uh, honor. That's the expression. No honor among thieves. So I think she's going to think he's good, he's going to think she's good, and they walk hand in hand till about that midpoint when he raises up. 
and begins to squelch her. And in the end of chapter 17, remember, we read the beast and the, the ones who gave their power to the beast, they kill her. They, they Remember what all does it say to her, the, the, how they destroy her? Uh, it's a horrible picture. Come on, go back to 17 for me. End of 17. Is there a trick here today, Roger? Mm -hmm. Never mind, it's, it's doing it. <coughs> Might have just been me. Um, the very end of 17, we're going to look at, um, okay, 16. The ten horns which you saw and the beast, and the beast of the Antichrist who we're talking about. These will hate the harlots. At first, shoot the writing, the waters together, and the waters are the people. Now, they'll hate the harlot, make her desolate, naked, eat her flesh, burn her up with fire. For God's put it in their hearts to execute his purpose by having a common purpose and by giving their kingdom to the beast until the words of God will be fulfilled. So he puts in their hearts to, to send their allegiance over to the beast, and they'll work along with the beast and destroy her, even if she's been their best friend, even if she's been feeding them and, and they've been doing well with her. They're going to give that allegiance to this beast, and it tells you very clearly, the woman whom you saw is a great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. Who was reigning over the kings of the earth when Yochanan John wrote it? Right, the Roman Empire, okay, and, and uh, what we're seeing is, is Roman Catholicism because we're talking religion, but then we're seeing Babylon in, in the Roman Empire as a whole, because it's in Iraq, in that area, in, on the Euphrates. So, does that clear it up? Are we okay? Okay, okay. So we see really, you know, a complete destruction of Babylon both ways. We see it uh, economically, we see it spiritually, we see it, let's see, i got to get to the end of this. We see it um, politically, you know, every which way. And again, the very end of 18, isn't it? Yes, the reason, I believe the full reason why God allows his wrath to be poured out in this degree and the world to come against her in the degree that that happens also, because in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all who have been slain on the earth. It sounds like he's holding her responsible for almost all of, of um, religious martyrdom. So I think she has to have a share in, in the lion's share of it, really. You know, there may be, and there is, because we know there is in the Muslim religion also, that she's got a great portion of that that she is going to be held responsible for. That takes us all the way back to Revelation 6. And remember Revelation 6, when it, we see the number under the throne, so many that they can't even be counted, and they're under there crying out, Lord, God, how long till you avenge us? Their blood was shed innocently. They're the ones that is talking about here, the blood of the prophets. The prophets were the mouthpiece for God, and they came and they were killed. And we'll see even more of that during the Revelation period, during the, I should say, the Tribulation period. And then, of course, of the saints. And the saints can be all the way down to just the little peons that were willing to take that stand at that moment when it was either take the mark or die, and they chose death over pledging allegiance to the beast. Remember, that's what the mark is. The mark is saying, I belong to you. It's not just a simple little, oh, well, I'll get a pass card and I can do something. No, you are saying, I am giving my allegiance to this who we call the beast. It's not a small thing, and it's not done by accident. Nobody's going to have blinders over their eyes and not know what they're doing now. It's made very clear. You are giving yourself to the beast. Remember when you are witnessing to someone and they say, well, I'm not for the Lord, but... I'm not against the Lord. Your answer to them is you are one or the other. There is no middle ground. You are either on his side and for him or you are against him. There isn't a gray area. There isn't an in-between. The most you can say is we'll, we'll, we'll say, and we mean it in quotes, that somebody's on the fence when they're close to getting saved and you want the Holy Spirit to blow them over. <laughs> but that's just a figure of how we're speaking. They're still against the Lord, until yes. they're with him. Yes, you're against me. Yes. So, um, and again, when Babylon, which I believe is the headquarters of the Antichrist, remember, everything was coming through that. We saw all the, the merchants of the world. We saw it touched on every level, from pleasures to needs to everything. All going through that port, you know, is a hustling, bustling, and it's, it's, it's world control. 
it would be more than what our World Trade Center is because that's just world trade. It would be everything for the world is focusing in that one area. And when that's destroyed, the Antichrist has to do something. His power is being threatened. He is wobbling. He needs that. I'm too tough to be touched. So he's going to have to gain control quickly. But it's probably at this time when he, I said that he'll go over to Jerusalem to try to get his feet back under him and be strong. And I think it's at that time that the world's going to say, wait a minute, let's move while well, he's weak. So Russia's going to come down and say, I'm not going to let him go get control of Israel because Israel's got a spoil we want. And Egypt's going to say, hey, wait a minute, I want my piece of this also. And they're going to come up. The Red China's already on its way over and saying, hey, we're not to be ignored anymore. We want our cut of the pie here. And Europe's going to come against what's going on too. And you've got all of a sudden our shape of Armageddon. Now, is that far-fetched today? No. no. So let me give it to you one word. Oil. Oh. Nuclear. Oil. Gasoline. Oil. Every area of our lives we don't realize oil is a commodity that's precious. It is believed that Israel has discovered a wealth of oil in the Mediterranean area off the coast. It's hers. It's in her land. God put his name on that land, and he said that belongs to Israel forever. Egypt's right now saying, that's in the waters. That's not Israel's. We've got a right to claim that. That's out further than her territory. And Syria's saying, ha, you're not leaving me out. I'm getting there now. I'm in closer, and we want a part. That's going on right now. And Israel's arguing and fighting for rights and control. So take that. Move us forward seven years. Who knows what's going to happen during this time? But we can easily see scenarios. We can see what's awakening us to realize. Look at the powers that are causing problems today. <coughs> Russia, Iran, Iraq. Syria? Are those in the news all the time? Yes. Are those the ones that we're saying who's making that axis? Who's playing in the bedroom with whom against Israel? Where is it going to come from? And while we're looking up there, Egypt starts causing trouble down here on the border. Says, you know what? Well, they're sidetracked. We're going to get back up and we're going to gain what we want here. Wow. And then you've got internally in Israel, Hamas and uh, Hezbollah and uh, oh, there's the third. There's one other thing. Jordan. <laughs> But Jordan's on the side, not right. inside Israel. But you've got internal struggle going on. You can see why she's volatile. You can see all this going on. And when Daniel 1140, and I'm, I'm talking a lot about verses 40 through 45 right now. You can read them later on your own. Where we may get into them some today. And we're kind of doing our chapter backwards. But we'll get there. <laughs> but when you read about how they're all coming to take a spoil from Israel, I do wonder, will it be? Because she's got oil control. And whoever controls that's going to control the power of the world. Because especially nuclear-wise, whoever's in, in control of that has the say. And so I find it very interesting that the countries that are being mentioned are the ones that we see being mentioned. And then it just slipped my mind what I was going to say. Um, oh, in, in Daniel 11, it says that the Antichrist sits at his fortress between the seats in the glorious land. Well, the glorious land, the beautiful land, if you, either word you have in your translation, that's Israel. And so when you talk about, okay, between the seas, hmm, well, if I look at a map of Israel, I see right here a huge Mediterranean Sea. The only other one that I can really see, you do have Sea Galilee, and you do have Dead Sea, and they're about the same, because Sea Galilee it, it runs down empties into the Dead Sea. So, you know, it's, it's not perfectly lined up, but it's on that side. So between the seas, what do you have? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Where's the false prophet's headquarters? Jerusalem. Where's Antichrist going to come across? Jerusalem. Where is the Battle of Armageddon? Well, the Battle of Armageddon actually takes place throughout the land. We've talked about that before, and we will again. But what's the king prize? Jerusalem. Get control of Jerusalem, got control of Israel, got control of Israel, move out. Okay, the rest. You can see how it's all lining up. I tell you, turn on your news and open up your Bible. It's not hard to see. 50 years ago, hmm, how's this going to be? 100 years ago, the whole world is going to see this? How's that going to be? <laughs> I get it instantly. I can go look at Jerusalem, Israel, right now. I can go to 
the webcam that's at the hotel, the Western Walk, and I can look at the little ants moving at the Western Walk. Those are little people. And I can see them in San Bernardino, California, right now. How many of you watch news on your phones from around the world? Yes. And you go in these countries where they have nothing, absolutely nothing. They don't even have lights, indoor facilities, nothing. But they all have a cell phone. What? Is it not oh, sure. amazing? Does it not? Yes. We laughed in 19... I think it was either in late 70s or early 80s. We laughed when we were in Israel. And our tour guide told us, get ready for your picture op. So the whole side of the bus says, everybody on one side there. You know, she turned around with that and laughed and says, wonder the bus didn't fall over. But what were we watching for? We came up on a Bedouin tent with a TV antenna. That was the big deal then. Here he's in the middle of nowhere, has nothing. We're on an ancient road, no lights, nothing with this road, and here's a TV antenna. Well, that's exactly what the cell phone has done now. That is what they do, and they do plug in. And you can't tell me that that isn't a way that the Antichrist is going to use for his control. Get a weird set up for it. Does that mean don't use your cell phone? No. Just bring it on. Let's go home. <laughs> you, mentioned, you mentioned a little while ago about um, um, drugs. Yes. Yes. And, and I don't know why, but I see... And it's, it's not in general, and I'm, I'm not generalizing, but a lot of homeless people. Mm -hmm. You say, but well, why are they there? Some of it has to be drugs. It is. Some of it has to it be that you don't want to be responsible or that homeless people. Oh, it, it's, it's so prevalent everywhere. I mean, I was so amazed to see that uh, on television not too long ago. How it's all over. I mean, it, it is. I mean, it is. the 50s, you didn't see that. <laughs> No, and I'm not old enough to say that, but I hear you, and in that, did you want to add? The 50s didn't have rock and roll. Rock and roll ushered in all the drugs. Yeah, really, and I love rock and roll, but it's like, oh my gosh, I forgot, you know, it's like, But it did open a door. It made it cool. It, and it, it opened a door, it. and it spread it. And yes, and you do have homeless that are addicted to drugs. And again, when I'm talking against drugs, I'm not talking against something if you need an antibiotic. I'm not talking something like that. I'm talking about what's the mind, what's altering the mind. And that's what is so dangerous. And people will so easily, oh, well, I'm depressed, so I'll take this. <laughs> well, have you listened to those commercials? I'm not a, a, much of a TV watcher, commercial watcher, but every drug that comes out, I wouldn't want to take. That's right. So many uh, uh, side effects. Side it, and, effects. And almost without exception, if it makes you suicidal, if it makes you suicidal, if it makes almost without exception, you hear that on every single one. And yeah, Pastor Kill's great. I'm going to guess this, so he can blame him for some of what I'm saying now too. But who wants you to kill yourself? Who you know? Who has got this control? This stirring? This he is working in those drugs. Those drugs come out of witchcraft. Like he says, what God is that doctor? And he doesn't mean your little doctor, but you're going to the doctor of drugery. You're going to the doctor of sorcery. You're going to the doctor of pharmacy. You're going to the doctor of sorcery. You know, well, what do you expect to get then? You're going to get side effects that are in his favor and not. What is of God? So you need to be very, very careful about opening up to that because a lot of people think, oh, well, I'm not doing the street drugs. This is prescription drug. But then they're addicted to the prescription yes. drug and they need more and they need this and they need that and they have those thoughts and they have these side effects and they're wondering what's happened and they don't control their life anymore. Remember that speaker I talked about that takes them slowly but surely? You remember how Guyana happened? Yes. He didn't get 900 people to drink Kool-Aid on day one, but he started controlling their minds. He started controlling their minds. And I'll take you on to just a little side in, in just two sentences. When you go to church and you listen to your pastor's sermon, and believe me, I'm talking about my peers. So I'm not saying anything that isn't true here too, and do the same thing with me. Do you sit there? Oh, every word my pastor says is true, it's right, it's good, I'm going to live by every word my pastor says.
and you never open that Bible, and you never look at it outside of that Sunday, you never go to the scriptures and study it for yourself. Well, guess what you're doing? You're following a leader, just like they follow a cult leader. Thank God your pastor isn't a cult leader, or the you would be a guy on a tragedy. You've got to use your mind. I tell people all the time, you come in my class, don't check your brains at that door. Bring your brains in here, sit them down, open them up, and use them. Am I saying what lines up with Scripture? Then believe it and go on it. If you can't see it in Scripture, challenge me with it. Come to me, talk, let's see. I can be in error, people. I don't want to be. I pray to God all the time. If I'm speaking error, don't let them hear it. Let them only hear truth. But I'm not perfect. We are trying to understand. We, none of us have it 100%, but we've got to stay so close. How do you know a counterfeit bill? Do you study counterfeit bills? No. no. You study the real one. You want to call everything else out? Study the real one. Remember what I call the Bible? It's his love letter. That's what it is. It's a love letter. I get a whole love letter, and I want to study it. I want to read it. I want to, I want to digest it. I want to be able to call out anything that comes against that. And I have high respect for my pastor, for your pastors. I'm not talking against the pastoral people. But if they don't tell you to use your brain, run. And if they tell you to believe it because they say it, run. Okay? How many times have you heard, don't believe it because Rochelle said it? Believe it because you can open up the Word of God and say, here it is. Scripture and verse, Scripture and verse, Scripture and verse. If you can't do that, don't go out on that limb because it may break and we both may get hurt. <laughs> Off my soapbox. I don't want to go there and stay there today, but, and I don't know why we're there, but hopefully that's a benefit to you. But we see what the world is coming to. We see Babylon all around us in symbolism. But we also see the literal, literal fulfillment, I believe, of it here. And we'll still be touching on that, but let's go ahead and move on to chapter 19, which starts with very uh, important words, very uh, familiar words, because we've heard this before, in fact, a number of times in the book of Revelation, after these things. I took you to chapter 4, I think the first time when we read, out, no, 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 the first time after these things correlated with chapter 1. And then it was verse 4. But my point being, remember in verse 4 we said it was after the facts, uh, not the facts, sorry. I lost my train of thought for a second. Chapter 4, when it said after these things meant after what we read about in 2 and 3. 2 and 3 was our churches and our church age. So we saw that 4 is a break, it's a change, it's after these things. I'm pointing this out because for the most part, Revelation is a book of order that lays out God's end plan. We have a couple of times where there's a chapter that's like a parenthesis or another view, but we see it laid out in order. So four, which the tribulation hasn't even yet started, is after the church age. What do we see happening to Yochanan? Come up. Is that what we're going to hear? Come up. It sounds very much like a picture of the rapture for us. Yeah. I'll show you things which should come here after, after these things, after the things that we read about in chapters 2 and 3. So there was 4. We moved from 4 and 5, which 5 also was a heavenly scene. It was the Lamb on the throne, and we'll talk about that today too. But then chapter 6 started the tribulation, started with the four horsemen. Remember the first one is, is in white, and many people say, oh, well, that's got to be the Lord. When does the Lord bring in death, war, famine, pestilence? No. This is the counterfeit again. He comes in. He doesn't have the bow. He, I mean, he doesn't have the arrow. He's got the bow, but not the arrow, because he comes in conquering, but he comes in with flattering words, and he conquers peacefully, and he sets up a false peace treaty. Oh, I can make peace between Israel and her Arab friends. <laughs> friends? <laughs> Should have been a hint. <laughs> but they swallow him. And the tribulation has begun. Now we've gone all the way through verse 18, and we know this is tribulation that we've been talking about. It's called it the great tribulation. It's called it the wrath of God. It's called it the time of Jacob's trouble. It's given every name. We've seen it from the prophets of old, from Joel, from uh, Ezekiel, from Daniel, from Isaiah and Jeremiah. I mean, we've been in all of these books, uh, and heavily in, in Daniel. Because Daniel and Revelation are the two that feed each other the most, with the end time view that... Daniel was given that by all the way through. 
and Revelation giving us more detail in the specific 70th week of Daniel. Remember that name? So when you think we need to study Daniel if it's talking about the 70th week of Daniel? So all the way through, now we've got that key phrase again, after these things. So we know after Babylon's been destroyed, here is what's coming next. And in a synopsis, so that I don't throw you for a loop, I'm not saying the tribulation's over, because what's the end with? Battle of Armageddon. Everything culminates, comes up, everything's ahead, the whole world's coming against Leal Israel. And that's when God says, okay. Thank you. Perfect words, Tony. Enough is enough. And he comes down in the form of his son, Messiah of Israel, who will fulfill all of those prophecies of kingship. That's what we're going to be coming into. 19 is going to bring us into that battle. 20 is going to give us that kingship. We're going to see the rule and the reign. 21 is going to tell us about our new home. 22 is going to tell us what goes on into the future. Only so far, though. Then stay tuned. God's going to write it for us. <laughs> or speak it to us, or whatever he decides to do. But so after these things, specifically after the judgment of Babylon, that we see our time clock is moving. And remember, tick-tock, God's clock. Okay, And it's always in relation to Israel, too. We see that. Although we can spiritualize that, personalize it for ourselves. That after this, these things, after the judgment, spiritual judgment and physical judgment of Babylon, and especially the physical, because that's what 18 ended with. After these things, I heard something like a loud voice. Behold. That's a great. <laughs> we need a behold in there, don't we? <laughs> and we're going to get a hallelujah. That's why I can hardly wait. <laughs> but uh, we've got 30 beholds in Scripture, in Revelation, I mean, and there's not one here, but it, it, I think it comes. I think I studied it coming. We'll find it. Anyway, it is still important. After these things, a great voice, a loud voice, of a great multitude, or much people. Now, I'll hint you right now, so that we can follow it as we go along. I believe that this is going to be the voice of those martyrs under the throne that I referred to back in Revelation 6, 9, and 10. I'll show you why in just a few verses as we go down here. But keep in mind, it most definitely is a heavenly scene. This scene is taking place in heaven. How do I get that? Verse 1, it says, in heaven. And remember what I just said, don't believe it because Rochelle says it, believe it because you see it in scripture. So we're back up in the heaven. Remember how the Lord is so kind to us that in the midst of studying all of this horror and all of this, I never came up with a better word than yuck, <laughs> but all of this, he always gives us that moment of, <sighs> look this way, here we go. Because what do we hear? Ruth, what did you say a minute ago? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Salvation and glory and power belong to our God. i got to take you back up into heaven and wake you up again. Because you know how quiet this little classroom is right now? <laughs> Heaven's not. <laughs> Heaven is noisy. Put yourself up there. Don't put in earplugs. Hear it. Hear it in its entirety. Hear it in 360 degrees around you because that's how we're going to see it. And if it doesn't explode inside of you, check your pulse. I think you're dead. Hallelujah. What does that word mean? It'd be best spelled. They don't do it, but it would be best spelled if you took the J and instead put a capital Y. Hallelujah. Yeah. Praise to God. That's what it means. Yah is a name for God. Hallelujah is praise. Praise to God. So this huge, loud voice, and I'm going to ask you because I need help. It's not one person in heaven. It's a multitude. So I want everybody together to say, Hallelujah. Yay. You haven't heard us? I think they were rejoicing. So hallelujah. And what are they praising God for? Oh, we can praise Him for everything. But what are they praising Him for here? Salvation. Stop right there for a moment. Just salvation. Just right there. Salvation is victory. It is deliverance. It may be deliverance from a physical setting that we're, being, we're talking about. But over and above all, we always think of it in its purest form in, and I can't use the word religious because it's not religious. It is a relationship. We are saved by God's grace. Hallelujah. These people are shouting out that they are saved. 
And I believe that they're seeing it on both levels. They've been delivered spiritually in their souls, and they have been delivered physically also. And their blood is about to be avenged. Excuse me. So salvation, that's because of God, because of Yah. He deserves a hallelujah for saving. He wasn't caught short. He didn't lose a battle. These people under the throne wasn't because, oops, God wasn't in control, or he didn't have his eyes on everything. No. We don't understand why some are called a martyrdom and others are not. But God says beautiful in his eyes is the death of his saints. They came home into a glory that is theirs. I have have a special crown because they're given the crown of life. Even if you lose your life here, that crown life, that martyr's crown, because they deserve it. They were found worthy because they stood for our Lord, who didn't let them down, didn't miss it, didn't forget them, but he lovingly took them out of it and home. At that point, they didn't want back. <laughs> They're glad to be home. And I'm sure that he gave to them the martyr's grace that we read about of so many that as they're going to their death, Stephen being the first, you don't hear him crying out how much pain he is in. They say that Stephen's face was a glow as he looked up into heaven and he saw his Savior welcoming him home. And I believe that for each one who goes through that, that they're met in that way on that level, that I have no clue. They're special. They're privileged. They've got something between them and the Lord. Mm. Hallelujah. Salvation and glory. Now, I have to tell you in the Greek, each one of these words gets the word the in front of it. That makes it specific and stop and think and focus on each one. So, the salvation, the deliverance, the deliverance of the plan of salvation, the deliverance of the body from, from the torment that it was in. The deliverance. Now it's the glory. Glory of God. Hallelujah. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> I'm with you. The glory of God. They are beholding the glory of God all over heaven. We are told in Hebrews 1, verse 2, the glory of God is Yeshua Jesus. He is the express image, more than a mirror image, because they're one, and yet, I don't get it. But they're one and they're separate. They're one, yet you can see them separate. And we see the glory of God. Hallelujah. He is the one who saved them. We see Yeshua's work. We see him in his glory. Victor. They are home in heaven, in glory, surroundings. This is also the glory of God in his moral judgment. He is judging, and the earth is getting what it deserves. And those who have, who have um, spilled this blood, Mystery Babylon, and the individuals are being called on it. He is the avenger. And he does it right, and he does it just, and he does it fair. And if you've ever had a day in court where it didn't go down just and right and fair, or you've even just heard about it, you cry out for it on this level, take it worldwide now. Satan, who's thought he's had a heyday, who's been putting the saints to death, who's been beheading them because it's one of the fastest ways to get rid of them, and he's done it so many times that we can't even number them. No, he didn't get victory. Here is victory. Remember when he thought he had victory when Yeshua was on the cross, but what was Yeshua's word? It, it is Hallelujah! And how does he show it? In the, the glory of the resurrection. Yes. Ah. When the high priest went in with the blood of the Day of Atonement, he splattered with blood from all of the sacrifices that's been going on. He's been doing. He goes in with that blood and he puts it on the mercy seat. And he goes in. He's stripped down to his linen garments, he's just the, the the pure garments. That's it. That's how the children of Israel saw him go in. The next time they see him, he's come out and he's put on his priestly robes and he comes out in a glorious way and shows them he, he has been into the Holy Holies with the blood has been accepted and they are forgiven. 
upon you. That's a, a mini picture. Now take it to the heavens and see it in all its glory and then personalize it. That's for you and me. Even if we're not part of the martyred number, it's still salvation is victory for us. He shed his blood for me. He shed his blood for you. And what do I hear? Hallelujah! <laughs> you didn't expect to sleep for class today, did you? <laughs> I'm not going to give you a chance. I've been studying this since last night, just exploding, waiting for the day to be able to get it out. So hang on, because we've got the salvation, and we've got the glory. And now whether your scripts have it or not, I think it should be there. The honor. Okay, it's not an honor, but the honor. The honor talks about an exalted position. What do you call the judge? Your honor. What do you call the greatest judge? The one who's judging morally, right, and pure. The one who is bringing justice on every level for every bit of slain blood from of all Abel all the way to the last one that'll be martyred. He deserves honor. Honor, respect him, realize his position, and wow, and he's in a relationship with me. The power! Wow! We've got the power. Power, the Greek word, gives us our English word. Dynamite! Blow that mountain up. You think you got a hold of it? Blow it up! Make it bigger! His purpose is fulfilled. He wasn't caught asleep. He wasn't caught in trouble. He didn't lose one battle. He didn't lose one soul. All that would come to him, he saved. And they're all going to be in heaven together in glory forever. Hallelujah. No victory when the ones that were <coughs> martyred was lost. Don't worry about the one who can harm your body. Worry about the one who can destroy the soul. The soul, Amen. The soul is in God's hands. He has the power. And remember I told you that high priest would come out and they would see him and they'd know that God accepted the sacrifice? Well, Yeshua shed his blood. I believe literally took his blood, put it on the mercy seat in heaven, opened up heaven for us. When he was done, he came back down into, to earth, into his earthly body, because we know he literally raised from the dead. That's power. Yes. That's power. Oh, man. How do you raise from the dead? God yeah. raised Yeshua, Jesus, from the dead. And that's the power, the resurrection power, that doesn't just take care of sin, but sends it, erases it. That's even better than erasing. It's gone, it's forgotten, it's sent away, it's been, the wages of sin is death. But it's not just paying that price. It's the next step, giving back life. Resurrection power gives us life. In that life, we have power. Do you feel weak? Mm -hmm. You have the Holy Spirit in you. You have the power of God in you. You have the resurrection power of Jesus in you. He is alive. Mm -hmm. And because he is alive, I too. Amen. And as Job said, one day I will stand with my Redeemer, with ten thousands of his saints, and come in that victory war. That's Judah and Job. I put them both together. But come in that victory. Come back warring with him to put again away the enemies then. But one day, all enemies, everything, including Satan, under forever. That's power. Yes. This is worth another hallelujah. <laughs> the glory, the power, the honor, and it all belongs to God. To God and God alone, and of course in Him, Yeshua, I mean, the triunity of God. Is that a verse that just explodes? Are you excited? Do you feel it? <laughs> it's called the victory dance. It's the victory dance, and I'm dancing already. <laughs> yeah, good way to put it, I like that. Thank you. There's reason for all of this here, too. Even though all I've said is true, there's also, as we keep our focus of what's going on right now, we have their reason again, but then verse 2, because his judgments 
are true and righteous. Remember the honor, the honor of the judge, the judge, the judge, and he is judged rightly, perfectly, justly. And what has he just judged? What has sent up this hallelujah to heaven? Babylon. What does Babylon represent? The harlot. The judgment against all false religion, against all idolatry, against all that has brought his beloved children to the point of martyrdom, all of that now is done away with. They are being avenged. Satan's headquarters has been destroyed. Uh, he's on his way out, people. It's coming. It's coming. He's going to throw everything at it that he can, called Armageddon, but we already see the victory. So, end of what I believe that is represented by false religion. That alone would be enough reason to praise God and those judgments that are right and sure and true. But how do I get this and why do I tie it in with the martyred? Uh, yeah, why I say the martyr? Because, again, he, he's avenging their blood. And this is what we've, we've got here in our next phrase, where he's judged the great harlot. He has judged Mystery Babylon. He has judged her spiritually. He has judged her commercially and politically. Who was doing what? She was corrupting the earth with her immorality and he has avenged the blood of his bondservants on her. Wow. Okay, here's where we have to break it down again and get it all. The reason why is because they're praising him because God's judgments are righteous. I think I've said that. Look real quick at Revelation 15, 3. Go back to, to chapter 15 and verse 3. And we read. Uh, okay, i got to back you up just a little bit. Um, okay, verse 2 tells us, I saw something like a sea glass mixed with fire. Those who had been victorious over the beast and his image and the number of his name standing on the sea. Okay, so these are the ones that won the victory over uh, the beast. And they sang the song of Moses, the bondservant of God, the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works. O Lord God the Almighty, righteous and true are your ways, King of the nations, who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name, for you alone are holy, for all the nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts and deeds have been revealed. That's what this is a part of it, is singing that song of victory, the song of Moses, because remember, Moses brought them delivery out of slavery, brought them out of Egypt, and they sang a song of deliverance then. Here's a song of deliverance, the song of Moses. And why the song of the Lamb? Because he's the one who delivered. He's the one who brought the, the victory and the delivery. Look also at chapter 16 and verse 7. It takes us so long to go through in our study, and if we don't remember it all, I've got to bring it back together for us. And I heard the altar saying, and this is basically under the altar, Yes, O Lord God, the Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. All of the heavens resounding. I believe all the heavens just hanging there waiting for it to happen. We're waiting for it to happen. I believe even in creation, it's just waiting for it to happen. Because remember when the Lord says certain things when he was walking on earth, like if I don't say it, even the stones would cry out. Yes. And you know, I've just learned that I can't get it scientifically enough in my head to say it, but there's a sound that they know that the stars are making. Really? And they're calling it the language of the stars. Wow. Wow. What are the stars saying? And praising our Lord. They sing it absolutely. Because remember, he flung them out with finger work. He called them all by name, and he put his gospel message in them. So we hear it and see it in our study, but are they telling the gospel on another level? And I don't mean telling it for salvation, but telling it as we do to glorify God. Praise you, God. Can you imagine the, the little star that got to be a picture, a part of the Lord's atoning work? Wow. And remember, the angels stepped forth out of those stars to the shepherds who study 
the stars. And I'm talking about astronomy, not astrology. And they knew because, well, the wise men knew to come because the king had been born. They saw it. The sign in the, the constellation standing for Israel showed the king of Israel had been born. That's what set them out on their way and put them on their way to Bethlehem, to Bethlehem. And they followed the star to come to where Yeshua was. The stars are talking. If the stars are talking, I'll bet you anything the trees are talking because I read in scripture that the trees are going to clap their hands. I clap my hands in joy. That's an expression when my words are falling short. And here's where I go to introduce you to my new word, ineffable. The ineffable name of God. Ineffable means that it is too great, too big, too wonderful to be contained in words. It can't do it justice. You know, that I love that because how many times have I stood here and said, my words fall short. I'm trying to get us to, to understand this level of infinite mightiness, miraculousness, power, and glory, and strength, and honor. And it just falls short. And I, I come away thinking, I didn't even scratch the surface, Lord. Help. And I tell you, no, it's a great ocean. And I'm trying to put the ocean in a teacup. And I remember when they said I'm running out of words, and our Lou said, yo, and we all laughed. <laughs> But I'll never run out of words again because I got one. <laughs> my favorite word. The ineffable name of my holy God. And he deserves hallelujah, glory, honor, praise because he has avenged the blood of those who were martyred for it. Because he has dealt justly and righteously with mystery, Babylon. He has called out this false religion standing for all false idolatry. And what is idolatry? It is anything that replaces God. Anything that replaces God is anathema and deserves to be more than abolished. He has judged on this. He's judged the great heart of the apostate church of the tribulation. Remember Laodicea? She thinks she's wonderful. She thinks she sees and she thinks that she's clothed well and she thinks she's rich. And he says, you're blind and you're naked and you're poor. Wow, but how many have swallowed that lie? Mm -hmm. And the ones per per perpetuating the lie deserve the justice that's coming and that we see here. She was corrupting. She did corrupt. Greek word shows that she was habitually, and I'm back in 192, by the way, shows that this was habitually going on. This wasn't just a one-time <laughs> circumstance. This is what was going on with the people because of this mystery Babylon, because of this Babylon also commercial and political. And I'm looking for where I'm reading it. The great harlot who was corrupting the earth. That corruption went worldwide over the whole face of the earth. Tribulation is over the whole face of the earth, and rightfully so. It is not, oh, this is Israel's punishment. No, Israel, yes, reaps what she has sown, and because she is in disobedience to her God, he is having to awaken her through calamity, through trial, through suffering, through the time of Jacob's trouble. But it's also coming against all the nations. It's also coming against all the Gentile nations, and I don't mean Gentile in a bad way, it's just non-Jewish, that have come against his people that have come against Israel, they also are being judged at this time. They were corrupted by her also. Remember, they all drank her wine. They all went into that stupor. They all fell into her lie. Think of the, of the immoral woman, how she entices and makes that bed and, and then puts out the trap and brings them in, or a spider that brings that fly and gets the fly into the web, and then that's it. That's what I'm seeing. And that corruption has been stopped. It's been a bench now. It's been called to an end. She was, when it says, uh, if you have that, that uh, with fornication or with her immorality, with fornication, that does not just mean, although it's true in the physical also, but it's a spiritual immorality. It's a spiritual fornication when they went, and the scripture says, a whoring after other gods. They went into an adulterous relationship apart from the one true and living God. And there is where I see all of this now. He has avenged the, the blood of his bond servants on her. Why I think that the, the loud voice coming out of heaven is these, that he has avenged. They're the ones sending out this hallelujah right now. Because remember, heaven is full of hallelujahs. 
Heaven is full of the resounding chorus that is going on in constant praise to our God. That's why I say it's not quiet, people. <coughs> I don't think you can find a quiet spot in heaven. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's why we're not going to sleep. You're not going to need to either. It's not that you're forced to stay awake. You don't need sleep. <laughs> and who wants to go to sleep when they're that excited? But, you know, I, I, I hear and I see in different ways at different times, and we've looked at it through the book of Revelation, where a hallelujah goes up, and then it's like it, it provokes it from someone else and someone else and someone else. Have you ever been in a room and you hear something like that? Somebody says it up. Hope did it for me just a few minutes ago. It's like, yes, and my, my spirit shouts out a hallelujah too. So here we've just been looking at one group. Just this group under the throne, and I believe that they're the ones with this loud voice that has set off this hallelujah. But it's not going to end with it. We're coming. Hang on. Hang on. We're there. You're going to see. Okay? Um, and when it says that uh, the, um, on her or at her hand or from her hand, literally, she is being held responsible for it. This was her doing. She's not being punished for somebody else's sins. She's being punished for her own. But... She has been the tool of Satan through all time to bring the, the drunkenness of idolatry and the fornication to the world. And they've all drunk at her cup. They've all imbibed. But look, um, well, it'll come in a second. Uh, yeah, we're ready. Um, I'm looking for where, where it talks. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and a second time they said, <laughs> and I think the second's louder than the first. So that's great. A second time they said, Hallelujah. Her smoke rises up forever and ever. You know, when we say salvation is forever and ever, if it stops, then this would stop. It doesn't. It doesn't. She is done with forever. Never to come back. Never to come back. Her smoke, I think, is signifying the judgment, the fire that was the judgment from God. Remember, fire is judgment. That smoke, it says, is sending up, rising up. The Greek shows it's continually going up. Now, obviously, in the physical, the physical burning of Babylon that I believe does take place, that's going to come to a point where that's ashes and it's gone. And we even say it's removed from the face of the earth. So we're not talking... Um, literal here, but we're talking about what is symbolically showing to us that the, the smoke ascends forever and ever and ever. It just doesn't end. It doesn't come back. It doesn't start again. It rises up forever and ever. It would be equal to our saying her punishment is eternal. It's for the ages of the ages. It just goes on. I like reassurances like that because I would I don't think I could stand the horror of thinking when we get through this and we're finally into our eternal side that it could start again. Yeah, history repeats itself here. I learned that when I was 12 years of age. That was introduced to me in my history class. My mom's mom had passed away when my mom was 12. And this little 12-year-old brain could not wait until she could turn 13 and her mom didn't die so that it wasn't history repeating itself. I don't know why that shook me. I, there must have been something at that time that got me. But I think of that here, and I think if I thought this could start again, the evil, the horror, having to go through this again, enough is enough. And we are promised this is the drop in the bucket. It feels like an eternity, doesn't it? <laughs> when you're in it and you're suffering from it, it feels like forever. But it's just a drop in a bucket of how long eternity is. Because when we've been there, as the song goes, 10,000 years, we've only just begun to sing his praises. Hallelujah! <laughs> so it goes up forever and ever. It's a totality in the destruction. Her wicked deeds are done. Her judgment is full and it is complete. It is total and it is eternal. Is there any other way I can say it? I think I've done it justice. So we've got... The second time, I think they're just, if I'm babbling like this here, and I haven't gone through what they did there, and haven't been waiting, I can imagine they want to explode. I can imagine that they just got to give it out, and give it out, and give it out, so the hallelujahs continue on. Not to be undone. <laughs> and it's not a contest, but not to be undone. Look at our next verse. The 24 elders. Who, who did we, what conclusion did we come to about our 24 elders? 
Very good. The church. We looked at that. Let me give it to you again because some were not here at this time. This goes all the way back to, um, I think it was chapter 3, that we looked at who the elders were. In synopsis, because you can get the whole teaching some other time. In synopsis, the elders were distinguishable from the angels. You've got a different group of people that are the elders. Okay? Now, in Scripture, we see certain characteristics about the elders, and I'm going to hit on these real fast that we need to see in light of Revelation 19. They're redeemed out of humanity. They're robed in white. They have crowns. And there's one other. It'll come up. I'll find it. It'll come up. Okay? Um, we're looking at... Um, Revelations 4. It, I think it's going to be before 4. Where's our first mention? It's verse 4, but I forgot to write down the chapter. Um, Thank you. Then that's right. <laughs> that's my own. Revelation 4, 4. That's right, because 2 and 3 is the church. So we're looking at it after we've studied the church age, and we've got our heavenly view. Yohanan John is in heaven, and that's when he was introduced to the 24 elders. He's seen them for the first time, and that's the first time that, that we're introduced to them and why we were talking about who they were then. Let me tell you also. This is the last time we're going to mention them. But we're not losing our friend. Because you're going to find out, remember? They represent us. So, we're part. We're there. Okay? So, and I've told you a little bit of their description. We'll get back to that also. They're not just spirits. So, they obviously have some, some sort of a body. I believe it to be a resurrected body. Or at least a, a resemblance of that. Uh, the idea that what I'm bringing across to you is that Whoever these elders represent, because they've got their um, rewards, which is the robe and the crown, shows that they've uh, been to the judgment seat of Christ. It shows that they have been rewarded. It shows that, that they have a resurrected body. Well, if the church is on earth during the tribulation, how can they have all that? Because that comes after the church age. So, to me, this is another indication showing that the church does not go through the tribulation because we're seeing them in their entirety on the other side of where we're at now. Just one more view. And by the way, that's the victor's crown. That's the crown that they are promised for victory. I have finished the race. I have fought the fight. Henceforth, it is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, etc., etc. Okay? This is not the diadem crown that the king wears. The king, the monarch crown, belongs to one and one alone. The crowns that we wear are victor's crowns that are given to us because of the victory that is ours. The victory that is ours in the salvation and being overcomers. Remember, how do you overcome? First John 5, 4, by our faith we are overcomers. So this is a group that has their crowns. This is a group that has their white robes. Um, and, and in fact, they're pictured as throwing their crowns at the feet of the Lord, so they've got them. And that's why I'm excited to have a crown. It's not because I want to wear crowns, and I don't. But when you really want to show appreciation to someone for something they've done, you want to give to them. You want to do something. I am so thankful the Lord doesn't leave me standing there empty-handed. He gave me something I can give back to. Isn't that cool? Isn't it just cool? Okay. Now, they're seeing... I haven't gotten to the four living yet. Nope. We stopped with the 24 elders. You didn't miss. They come first. And then it says, and. So we'll, we'll talk about the four living, but only shortly, because we did that earlier, too. But we'll, we'll get to them. The 24 elders, again, are seen only in heaven. They're not seen on earth during the judgment. They're only seen in heaven. Again, another view. We saw that they could not be a part of just the Gentile multitude. They also could not be a representative of just Israel. So I believe that they are a representative of both believing Gentiles and believing Jewish people that are both together. They are the only completed group of God's creatures that are left. When you rule out Israel, when you rule out the angels, when you rule out the martyrs that we see in verse 1, they're the only complete group that's left by complete, I mean, that, that they can be represented in their entirety. If the 24 elders were representing Israel, Israel's not complete yet. Israel is still going through the process, through the tribulation, through the millennium, so that it's not a complete. This is the only time that we have a complete body that could be represented. And then, when Yohanan's needing explanation, and it has to do with salvation for the human here on earth, God calls on one of the elders to tell him. Well, if an elder is representing us, 
what better person to explain something but than one who is part of that. In other words, if I wanted someone to explain something to you about a football game, I'm not going to give you me. <laughs> I'm going to go get you a sports enthusiast, a coach, somebody who's been in the game, knows it, and can explain it. And I can sit down with my nephew, who is a sport, and he can say, and shell, da 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 da, and I can understand. But I never would have seen or understood or known that without his help. So, an elder comes and explains to John, and an elder is one who has experienced salvation. So I believe all the way around, he's just seeing highlights, but that this group of 24 elders is representing the church age believers who have experienced salvation. And we are seeing in heaven, we're not seen on earth through the tribulation, we are seeing with our rewards already, I believe the judgment seat of Christ has taken place, I think right at the beginning of the tribulation. I think as soon as we get home to heaven, we get rewarded. You know, we're, we're, we're blessed so that we're ready to give to the Lord right away. Anyway, that's just it in a, a short, oh, by the way, angels are never um, crowned, and you never read the, of angels giving crowns to the Lord, okay? They glorify the Lord in a different way, but we do not see that in angelic activity. They're winged. They've got other, other uh, special qualities that we don't have. And it, do we not have a God of variety? Would he not want variety in heaven? I mean, if he gave us this much variety on earth... Heaven's got to, I mean, if you just have that narrow little, oh, there's streets of gold and there's mansions. <laughs> You're in for a rude awakening, a wonderful rude awakening of how glorious and how much more heaven is than that. Can you yeah. imagine just how much joy it gives to God and to the Lord to hear all of these praises up there? And it's, oh, exactly, goodness. exactly. And remember the 24 elders have the bowls that are the prayers of the saints that have come up that are being given to the Lord. And yes, they are harping and it doesn't mean all we all have to just be in the heavenly choir and we're just going to strum harps and just sing for those who don't like that, for those who do, it's wonderful. But for those who don't know, it's not just that. That's just one avenue of praise that's coming out of the 24 elders. Those prayers are praises. Yes, Patty, you are so right. All of this is going on. So the 24 elders now we see giving praise. You've got the martyrs under the throne shouting out hallelujah, and I can just hear Echo, 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 you know, chain reaction. So, 24 uh, martyrs, hallelujah. 24 elders, hallelujah. And they're praising God for this. And they're praising God for this. And he's able to know that the praises are for the different views. Now we also have the four living creatures. And we saw the four living creatures they gave us in, insight into the different attributes of God. We saw how amazing they were. We saw that they had wings and things that we don't have. And all of this given in praise and glory to our God. So the four living creatures also are there, but they're also worshiping God. Everything in heaven worships God. The angels worship God. The four living creatures, the 24 elders, the martyred under the throne, the ones who have come up, who have gone before us. Yes, they're represented by the 24 elders, but they're up there too. Yes, Loretta. Somebody asked me if it sounded like it'd be awful boring up there. I said, Are you kidding? <laughs> it's it's just party time. Party. Does God know the word boring? No. <laughs> Did God make you so you could be boring? Yes. 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 Oh my! <laughs> Boring? No way. <laughs> the lights. The lights are now that's on that the things of earth will grow strangely dim by the wonder and awe of His face. That's the Lord alone, alone, all that He has around for our enjoyment. I can hardly wait. This class, I want, I want to be raptured. Today. You know, I, I've, it's, I've been a Christian for so many years, and this class is just 
lamb. And that's where we're going to put our focus, and I'll yes. take you through just short, just highlights, but I'll take you through a little bit of what um, the Oriental marriage was like. And when I say Oriental, it's talking about customs of the Bible times. Because we get a little more in-depth in, uh, in view of it there. So that's just a time I'll for next week. This class is great. The next week will be good, too. You mentioned in the four creatures that they had the bowls, that they carried the bowls. Uh, no, the, the 24 elders have the bowls. Oh, the, the 24 <coughs> elders have the bowls that are the prayers of the saints that are coming out that they present to the people from God. Are the same God. bowls that were mentioned in the earlier part of Revelation? Yes, I believe they are. They are the same bowls? Yes, they're not the bowls of wrath of judgment that's being poured out. Okay. But when it talks about the bowls that are in the, the hands of the 24 elders, yes, I do believe it is the same. Okay. Yes, and I do believe that's the prayers going up. And prayers should be going up continually. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay, let's get up to the point of the, the marriage supper of, of the Lamb, because I think we can do that. Um, are, we, are we two verse five? Did I really do all of four? Yeah, yeah. Wow, I'm moving and I don't even know it. No, I didn't. I didn't get the end. No, I didn't. We've got the 24 elders. We've got the four living preachers. They sat down and they worship God who sits on the throne saying, Amen! Hallelujah! <laughs> we can't be cheated out of one of our hallelujahs. <laughs> it's all over heaven too. Don't you think the Lord is rejoicing in hearing our praises come up and in sending off hallelujahs all over again and again and again? The voice came up from the throne saying, okay, now, this is our next verse. This is verse 5. This is a voice coming from the throne saying. Now, before we say what it says, I'll tell you that there are two views. One is that this voice is Yeshua, okay? He does separate himself from the Father in the sense of chapter 5. We saw the God sitting on the throne and we saw the Lamb take the scroll out of the, the hand of the Father sitting on the throne. So we can see them separate. In that, this may be the voice of uh, Yeshua. I'm not sure. Um, the reason why... When you look at verse 5 where it says, and we'll come back um, into this in fullness, but it says, give praise to our God. That's what the voice is saying. I have a little trouble hearing the Lord say it that way. That just doesn't quite gel with, with me because he is God. And so, you know, I'm not sure, but I'll give you for an example why it could be. And I believe that that is... John 20, 17. I think I've got the right reference. So go with me and we'll see. If not, I'll look at my notes again. But John 20 and verse 17. 20, verse, 20 and verse 17. Chapter 20, verse 17. John 20 and verse 17. Yeah, this is why maybe you could, but I... You all get to be judge and jury. You get to decide for yourself. It's not going to make a big difference. In verse 17, this is after Yeshua Jesus is raised from the dead. She, he sees Mary in, at, uh, in the garden to Mary. And he says to her, Stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. So since he said it there, I guess he could say here, praise to our God. I still struggle with it a little bit, honestly. I, I, I still can't quite accept it 100%, but again, if you can, that's fine, and if you can't, that's okay, too. Uh, either way, we're still in a good place. And, he's, and, and he's possible because he has to be uh, acknowledged or they, they remember him as Jesus. And it would be remembering yes, the human side. In the spirit, you cannot see all right. Right, right. Okay, so Jesus, I said, okay, this is what I told you. Okay. Father, I pray to you. Yes. And yet, later on, during the, uh, during the, the marriage supper, mm -hmm. our marriage, uh, celebrating all that, then, all of a sudden, we'll find that, uh, there's only one sitting at the throne. And yet we still see the two because yeah. when we're married to the Lamb, we've got the Father Jehovah who has his wife, which is Israel. And if you don't know that, we'll get into that. We'll show you that. A uh, lot of thought there, though. 
you know, remember the praise that's going up right now is from the human side of the yeah. work, the atoning work that the Lord did. So it could be in a sense, because he even said, I came to do the will of the Father, I don't do my own will. He said, you know, all that the, the Father's given me, I've not lost and I won't lose one of them. So he does humble himself in that way. So it could be. Erman? Rachel, I have a reference a scripture that to, to what you're talking mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. in Psalms. Okay. Um, 15, 13, it says, He will bless those who reverently and worshipfully fear the Lord, both small and great. Mm -hmm. It just was referring to that. Okay, it's okay. okay. Well, it definitely like is. It like the Lord, like it says. Mm -hmm. Is it His voice coming out of the throne yes. and saying to praise our God, though? It could be. It could be. So we'll, we'll go on. You can decide for yourself that the voice comes from the throne. When, as soon as they hear from the throne, I think that. But it could be from the area of the throne. That's why it doesn't have to be. But if it's literally from the throne, then it has to be. You know, either Yeshua, Jesus, the Lamb, or God the Father. But saying give praise to our God would mean it would be Yeshua. So give praise to our God. Isn't that what we've been doing with the hallelujahs? Yes. Give praise to our God. All you his bondservants, you who fear him, the small and the great. That goes right with the what you just read in the Psalms, the small and the great. So again, and let's see, I, I am, where am I? Okay, I don't want to skip anything. Okay, the Greek tells us when, when it says give praise, keep on. Keep on giving praise. Keep on. Keep on. It shows that action again. It's an action that is continual. Keep on praising. And the reason for that praise, you who fear him, is this, I'm afraid of him? No. 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 This is that reverential respect that, that just makes us love him all the more. And in that, we're praising him. In that is what makes us do what the 24 elders do. Fall on their face before him in awe and reverence and respect and worship him. I think we're going to spin, I love that song, you know, when I first see the Lord in heaven, am I going to shout, have glory, hallelujah, be on my feet, or am I going to fall on my face? Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? Anything I'm going to do both. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm going to repeat. Stand, praise, fall, praise. Stand, praise, fall, praise. Stand, <laughs> praise, fall, <laughs> praise. <laughs> and if you want to be like my brother, he says, I'm just going to sit there like a little boy in the middle of heaven with the tears oh, pouring down my face, just oh, saying, thank yeah. you, Jesus. <laughs> you'll see your in heaven. Can do it. Can't you? Can't he turns into blubber. <laughs> my big brother, too. <laughs> There's no tears in heaven. Those tears are happy tears. Those are allowed in heaven. <laughs> we may not have to express ourselves that way, but those are happy tears. Those are definitely. So the praise is going on continually because we do reverence him. We do respect him. We do stand in awe, even at this magnanimous plan that he has revealed to us, even in the glory revelation of Yeshua and his salvation, and power, and glory, and honor, and justice as righteous judge. Just in this alone that we've talked about today is enough to overwhelm me. You've seen the excitement, but now I feel that awe coming over me. Do you not feel it? Do you not feel that we're in the presence of our holy God? And in that, I just, oh. yes. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. Then I heard something like the voice of a great multitude. It's noisy again. <laughs> a great multitude like the sound of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder saying, okay, well, all this praise that's going on, have you ever been, and I have not, but like at Niagara Falls, somewhere where there's rushing, is it deafening? I hear it's oh, deafening. It is deafening. Yes, that is roaring so loud. If you try to talk to somebody, they can't hear you because of the roaring sound of the on, waters. On the side of Canada, it's rolling, but on the side of the states, not so much. Interesting. Well, I'm talking about on this side, then, and I think that's why this is a description. I I forgot to look it up, but there's the song that refers to the voice of the Lord as like a mighty thunderous, the mighty thunderous thundering of waters. I'll, I'll get it for you. I want to say Psalm 46, but I don't think it is in 46. I'll, I'll look it up and bring it to you next time. But here is the idea. The voice of this great multitude is like the sound of water that, that's just rushing water. And I have been by streams that are rushing, and I have noticed the noise in that, and it's small compared. That's why I thought in the bigger. And the peals of thunder. You know, thunder, this is the magnanimous activity of God. You know, we one, don't control thunder. 117 yesterday against the magic. 
Okay. <laughs> Not quite what you were looking for. No, that no, wasn't quite what we wanted, but that's okay. No, when God gave the law, the beginning of it, the, the Ten Commandments, the beginning, because He gave far more than that, but that beginning, that's the area we just studied, what we just came through with at our Shabbat. And do you remember the mighty manifestation of God? Thunder, lightning, mountain shaking, smoke billowing, and it caused the children to fear. They're the ones that stood back and feared. It wasn't what God wanted, but he wanted them to see his power. I see in this that if God is that much greater, you know, this is not equal to that, but this is, is wow. This praise is deafening. If we didn't have our new bodies and our new ears, I think we'd blow our eardrums out. <laughs> I, I have uh, Ezekiel 124. It says, I also heard the sound of the, their wings like the sound of abundant waters as they went, like the voice of the Almighty. It sounded uh, tumult, like the, uh, um, the sound of an army camp. Whoever, whenever they stood still, they dropped their wings. So it's just the sound of wow. Okay. Even even yes. Have you ever been near a hummingbird? What was it? Yeah, the, you know the, the wow. And it's what just from the what was that? What was that? Ezekiel 124. It's Ezekiel's vision, and he's there's a vision in heaven. He's got a rainbow in there too, so I like it. That's good correlation to Revelation 10. Yeah. So I like it. Yeah, I like it. Right. Yes. Right. Yes. So I heard something like the voice of a great multitude, like the sound of many waters and the sound of mighty peals of thunder, saying. <laughs> For the Lord, our God, the Almighty reigns. And this is what we'll end up with. Let me un unpack it for you. Raquel, how about Psalms 29.3? The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The, the God of glory thundereth. The Lord is upon many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of that. Excellent. All you in your cross references, write down Psalm 29 3, and I'll get that in for next time also. Uh, that That's an excellent description, too. 29 3, and we had Ezekiel 124 over here, which was good. Irma, what was yours? Uh, uh, Psalms 15. Um, I'm sorry. That's okay. I threw you left for. They're all good. I think 29 3 sums it up totally, but they're all good. If not, you can oh, read Psalms 15, 13. 13. Psalm, I'm sorry, Psalms 115, 13. Oh, 115, 13. Okay, okay, very good. Okay, so we talked about the hallelujah. Um, I don't think I did it in verse 7, uh, 6, I mean. Um, hallelujah there is because God is victor. The devil's reign has come to an end. He is, and you may have, maybe that is the first word. Are we in 6? Yeah, we're in six. Okay, I thought I had to go to seven. Okay, we're in six. I am unpacking it now for you. Okay, you may have Lord God omnipotent. Is that how some of yours yes. reads? I read in this one, the Lord our God, the Almighty. Okay, well, the idea behind it is that omnipotence is power. Almighty, verse six of Revelation 19. Almighty is the all-powerful one. El Gabor is the mighty God. You, what you have is the greatest, the most powerful, the most mighty, the most magnanimous, the most ineffable. <laughs> she knew where I was going, ineffable. And this is the one who is victorious. That's what we're seeing. Do you know how long creation has been waiting for it? We feel like we've been waiting in eternity. We've only been waiting however long in our life we've been introduced to it. But all creation is groaning and moaning, waiting for the victory of the Son of God. And this is what we have here. We have victory. We have Him reigning. He is the one who has the last word. He has the last say-so. It is final. It is finished. It is over. It is done. And He is victorious. He is on his throne. When I look at one of the Hebrew to English translations that I have, it uses the phrase, um, and the words it uses is ki moach, that's um, he who is king, Eloheinu, that's our God, Yahweh, that's Jehovah, and then Sabaoth, Lord of hosts. So in that translation it's saying, the king, our God, Jehovah, 
the Lord of hosts, the Lord of the heavens, the Lord of the earth, the Lord of all. You know why they're all coming up with different angles? Because we're all trying to do one thing. Describe the ineffable name of our God. He is beyond description, but see him as king of kings. He is going to be crowned in that glory on earth, but he is reigning as king of kings now. See him as the Lord of it all. See him as omnipotent, all powerful. See him as omniscient, all knowing. See him as my God. Hallelujah. Our God. Yes. Alvenu. He becomes our God in that personal relationship. For those of you with me Saturday, does this take you back? The Lord, when God first gave the commandments, he said, I am the Lord, Adonai, your God. He personalizes it. That's worth another Hallelujah! <laughs> and on that note of praise, has this not been a wonderful class? Because we needed this. And hold on to it, because when we get a little further, we'll go back into the end. But remember, this will be the end, and this will be forever and ever. The hallelujah, an almighty, powerful, living God we have in relationship with each one of us. Wow. Can we go also to the uh, uh, Revelation 5? That's 5. Go ahead, read it. That talks about behold. Oh, yes. Yes, <laughs> behold. And any of you who don't know my behold, we realize when we see behold in Scripture, that stop. Wake up. Pay attention. Listen. You know, it's, it's the, the teacher's way of shaking you if you're starting to fall asleep. Behold. <laughs> outdo me in one little is the way God can outdo this class. We think we've got a handle. We just put the ocean in a teacup and it didn't fit. <laughs> Thank you, Roger. <laughs> he heard our hallelujahs. He commanded, let there be light, and there was light. Okay, well, I hope it's been a blessing to you today. I hope it lifts you wherever you're at. If you carry a burden right now, let it encourage you. God is in control. And he's an almighty, powerful, king of kings, and Lord of lords. Hallelujah. His ineffable name, and he is our personal God. Wow. And very loud. We're going to close in prayer. You want to sneak out before we do? We'll let you go if you don't. Okay. Anyone? Lord God, <laughs> you blew our socks off. You exploded our brains, and we can't hardly contain it. Thank you you changed us on the way up because we have to be changed to be able to contain and express and be able to get out all that is in our hearts. But thank you you know it now. And thank you you love us so much. Oh Lord God, let us go in that power. Let us have your praise on our lips continually and let us be in your word night and day, day and night. Let us come to your throne in our prayers and in our praises and let us use this week to count for eternity. Oh Lord God, let us witness and let us have that joy of bringing more home with us on that grand day. Soon and very soon to be in your presence forever and ever and ever. And we all say together, hallelujah, amen. Amen and amen. So be it. <laughs> Thank you.